This may be the single most talked about, written about, and obsessed over watch on Earth. The Rolex Cosmograph Daytona, since the name was first applied to a Rolex chronograph in 1963, has had an incredible journey from zero to hero. Unpopular at first, the Daytona has today established itself not only on the vintage market, where sky-high prices and broken records have become routine, but also as a current production model. A new steel Daytona on a bracelet is so in demand that it is generally simply unavailable, at least at list price. And the wait for one is measured not in days, weeks, or months, but in years. But underneath it all, it's still a watch. Let's see if we can peel back some of the layers of hype and find out what it's like to actually wear one for a week on the wrist. Despite the celebrity status that it currently enjoys, the Rolex Cosmograph Daytona did not start out as a superstar. In fact, exactly the opposite. Let's take a little bit of a look at the history of the Rolex Daytona and see how it went from being a relatively obscure slow seller into being one of the most desirable watches of all time. Although Rolex had produced other chronographs prior to this, the Daytona story really begins in 1963 with the launch of the reference 6239. You'll notice the Cosmograph signature at 12 o'clock, the now iconic inverse color subdials, and the tachymeters move from the dial to the bezel. A series of incremental changes were to follow. The Daytona signature was added at 12 o'clock in 1964, screwed down pushers in 65, and by 1967, Rolex had moved the Daytona signature to its current location at 6 o'clock. The watch went largely unchanged until 1988, when Rolex introduced a real game changer. This was the reference 16520, the first Daytona with an automatic movement. The new look and new movement took the Daytona from a functional, somewhat subdued tool watch to an impressive statement piece. In 2000, Rolex introduced the 116520, featuring Rolex's first in-house automatic chronograph movement, the Caliber 4130. And that brings us to the most recent incarnation, the Rolex Cosmograph Daytona reference 116500LN, released in 2016. This is, to many here in the room, the most iconic Rolex wristwatch in the world, possibly most iconic wristwatch of the 20th century. If you've been paying any attention at all to the watch world, you're probably aware that Paul Newman Daytonas continue to be some of the most collectible and also the most expensive watches sold at auction. Originally a slow seller produced in small quantities, the Paul Newman Daytona has seen a remarkable explosion of interest over the last 30 odd years. This meteoric rise in prices culminated in the sale of Paul Newman's own Paul Newman Daytona in 2017 for the then record price of $17.75 million. Thank you for your patience, Natalie. It is history now! The circumstances of that sale were unique, but the increase in prices of Paul Newman Daytonas reflects the explosion of interest in the Daytona in general as a collectible. And this aura has extended to the modern version of the watch. All right, so we've taken a look at the Rolex Daytona as a model going from 1963 up to the present day, and we've seen how it's changed over the years. We've also taken a little look at how it's performed on the vintage market and in auctions. The modern version of the watch, however, has attributes of its own that really are worth looking into, sort of below all the layers of hype that have built up around the watch. Let's do a little bit of a deeper dive into what makes up the Daytona. Let's start with the case. It's a cliche, but by no means untrue, that Rolexes are built like tanks and the Daytona is no exception. What we have here is oyster steel, 40 millimeter by 12.2 millimeter with screw down crown and screw down pushers. And as is typical with Rolex, everything looks and feels very precisely machined and assembled. The big update with this model when it was introduced was the ceramic bezel, which really does change the visual character of the watch from previous incarnations. I remember it as being a kind of a divisive uh, element for the company to have added to the watch. It is worth remembering though that something Rolex is known for is making incremental technical improvements to their watches, which actually represent a performance improvement. So leaving aside the question of whether or not we would sentimentally want a little bit more of a visual connection to the good old days, it's essentially age-proof, fade-proof, scratch-proof, and time-proof. And as such, the ceramic bezel is actually technically superior. Let's talk about the dial and hands. The one thing that's indisputably true about the dial of the Daytona is that over the years, it has gotten a bit busier. The dial now reads, Rolex, Oyster, Perpetual, Superlative, Chronometer, Officially Certified, Cosmograph Daytona. We also have Swiss made at the bottom, which I think we can give them a pass on. If you combine that with the metal subdial surrounds, the raised indexes with their white gold surrounds and the faceted hands, you've got a lot going on. 
So the criticism can be raised, is Rolex sacrificing legibility on what is supposed to be a sports-inclined chronograph? My own take is not really. While all of the detail on the dial and the quality of the hands, quality of the bezel, do tend to draw the eye much more than in earlier models, I still didn't find that the watch really sacrificed much in terms of legibility and daily use. Let's talk about the movement. The 116500LN features the in-house caliber 4130, which as we talked about earlier, first debuted in 2000. It has a number of features which are traditionally associated with high-grade chronometer-grade movements, including an overcoil balance spring and free-sprung adjustable mass balance. I think it's something that generally in the watch community, Rolex deserves to be admired a little bit more for. Sure, it's easy for the hype surrounding the Daytona to kind of overshadow the fact that inside is one of the best engineered automatic chronograph movements ever made, but the fact remains that's what's going on. And it's uh, pretty fantastic that you can buy the watch for one reason and find yourself admiring it for another. So what's it like to actually wear? How does it feel on the wrist? As we've alluded to earlier, it, it's really almost impossible to wear a Rolex Daytona without feeling the weight of all of that accumulated history and without being aware of all of the hype that's around it. You know, when you first start wearing it, you look down at your wrist and you see 17.75 million paid for the Paul Newman Daytona at auction. You see all of that history going back to 1963. You see the fact that this is a watch that so many people want and it's so hard to get. You see the fact that it's something that is probably going to retain its value at least for the foreseeable future. For the first couple of days that I wore this watch for sure, I was hyper, hyper aware of all of those elements. They were part of the experience. But I found that the longer I wore the watch, the more the watch became important and the less all of the hype became important. I wasn't particularly thinking about the glamour side of it or the social signaling side of it. I was just wearing a watch. And what kind of a watch was I wearing? I was wearing one that was extremely accurate, really well engineered, robust, reliable, and a small but definite pleasure to interact with on a daily basis. You know, in other words, I was wearing a Rolex.